All right, let's go to John in Atlanta, Georgia. John, what's up, man? Hey, Dr. D, how are you? I'm awesome. Hey, listen, so inside baseball, what in the world happened last time we were supposed to meet? You're supposed to be on the show a few shows ago, and what happened? <laughs> Well, I was trying to be a good citizen since I'm a firefighter um, and uh, didn't want to talk while holding the phone uh, in, the, in the car. And I try to pull over quickly and uh, forgot that I had a trailer on the back of my truck and sideswiped a car. It was awesome. You got so it was your fault? A hundred percent my fault. <laughs> oh, man. Are you OK? Oh, it was it was like a fender bender. I, my the wheel well of my trailer just went into their door and caused enough damage that the police and of course my firefighter buddies had to come and make fun of me. And it was awesome. Oh, that's outstanding. So this call is costing you thousands of dollars, right? Well, luckily enough, my deposit was or my deductible is only five hundred, but I'm sure my insurance will go up. So yes, but you're worth it, I suppose. I so can't say this is my, this. <laughs> You know, you love to say that this is the advice is worth what you pay for it, and you always say that it's free. So this is not the case. Oh well, uh, man, I know I'm gonna have to ramp it up a notch, dude. You you're like, uh, man. Well, I'm glad you're okay, and I wish you were a better driver because now I feel all nervous about this call. I can't screw this up. <laughs> you're a firefighter. You actually help other people, and you're clearly not a NASCAR driver, which is a good thing. All right, so John, how can really? I help? What's up? Okay, brief synopsis is uh, I um, met my wife and we started dating a little over three years ago, and then we've been married just about two now. Um, and while we were dating uh, and then subsequently engaged, she uh, went on to tell me that she had suffered from anxiety and depression. Um, but, you know, we weren't living together, so I didn't get to see the in and outs. We weren't living together until we were married. Um, I didn't get to see the ins and outs of every day. Um, and right as we were about to get married, maybe two weeks beforehand, she kind of alluded to that it was much more than she had let on um, and provide, sort of provided me an out. It was like, hey, if this mental illness is worse than I've told you about, is that something you're going to be able to handle? And if not, I'd understand if you don't want to you know, go through with the wedding. And we were getting married in two weeks and it was a destination wedding and people um, had already had their tickets and everything was paid for. So, I mean, what am I going to say at that point? Like, nope, let's not get married. I, um, uh, and then so hold on, let me, let me stop right there. Did you ask for more information then? <sighs> if I or did you just hug her? Guy, did I, you just hug her and like have a notebook moment and then say, I'm with you forever and it'll be fine? Pretty, yes, yeah, pretty much that. I, okay, okay. And, and, and it's how I feel now is that like that I'm in 100%. I was in then. If I'm going to, if I want to spend the rest of my life with her, I want to spend the rest of my life for better or for worse. That's right. Um, so I did not pry. No. Okay. Um, and I felt that honestly, if it was on her heart, like when God put it on her heart to divulge all that it was, it, that would be in her time. I didn't want to push her to tell me more. Um, in retrospect, I probably wish I would have a little more, um, because it was almost like once we got married, a switch sort of flipped. Uh, I, I can definitely correlate that to living together. Obviously you see a whole lot more of people, um, um, inside that you don't normally see. And then the, the fights just were, uh, I mean, full disclosure is that I was not like you say all the time is I did not have the tools in my toolbox to weed my way through this, but sure. the fights to me were just incredibly illogical. Like we would argue about things that, and I've been married before this is my second marriage. So I know what it's like to be in a marriage where little fights happen over nothing, but this was beyond anything I'd ever seen. And sure. uh, one fight got particular, particularly bad that I had to involve her mother in. Um, did and you? her mother went on to, did you? Uh, yeah. Oh, because I was worried about her safety, to be honest with you. Um, yeah, but you, all right, man, when you still, no, no, no. And, and one time, I'll let me back up too. This was also uh, at, man, at, at her suggestion, which was, Hey, I think you should talk to my mom about some stuff that's going on. She could probably help you navigate this. So this was at her suggestion uh, also. Um, and at that fight, her mom basically said, Mandy, I think it's time to tell him the full truth of what's going on. Um, and that full truth was, <laughs> so, that she was hold on. So her mom knew that she had been holding things back from you and lying to you before you got married. Uh, I don't think necessarily she knew that. I think it came out in this big, in that big fight that I'm referencing. That you had no idea. Anyway. Correct. Okay. So and, I, I, before you keep going, I want, I want to back up for anybody listening to this. It is not quote unquote prying to get full disclosures of medical issues, of mental health issues, of personal challenges, of past history. You are the, the idea of marriage is to become one. 
you are hitching yourself to somebody else and saying ride or die till this thing till the wheels fall off this thing it is not prying it is not like hey digging in it's not hey you can tell me on your own time man you got to talk you got to talk to each other man um sure and if you're on the other side of this and you're with somebody and you're dating somebody or you're thinking about it you got to be honest you got to tell the truth otherwise you become you're it's not just my personal thing it's deceitful. You're lying. You're not telling the truth. And I know that's hard to wrap your head around um, the woman you love, but wow. And um, okay, so you things get so bad, you got to call mom. And then what happens? She went on to tell me that she is uh, uh, clinically diagnosed um, with bipolar type 1. Okay. Um, she has a, a personality disassociative disorder. Um, a mood lability, kind of the same thing in that same category, and then severe anxiety and depression. Okay. Um, she does have substantial past traumas, um, molestation by family members, and then when she uh, reported it to her parents, her parents basically told her she was a liar. Um, oh, sweet. And so a good was, moment, she yeah. has a lot of traumas that she, in her past. Yeah. And the long and the short of it is that in the beginning I was, you know, so confused and I was not a Deloney disciple at that point. <laughs> um, and being a critical care paramedic and a firefighter, I did what I'd say the more I hear your show, most guys do who have the best of intentions is I tried to fix it. Try to go and solve it. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And I really had the best of intentions and it just was not what she needed. And I didn't know that at the time. Yes. Um, uh, and that's, it hurts my heart that I maybe furthered her, um, her state at the time. Um, I wish I could say that was all, all the problems that we had aside from the fights and the ups and downs of bipolar people don't realize, I mean, I hear people say all the time, just friends of, you know, not friends of mine, but just people around like, Oh, my spouse has bipolar, but there, I mean, there, I think there's a, a big misconception about what bipolar is, especially when someone is bipolar type one. It's I mean, one it's, of the most over, um, Overdiagnosed diagnostics, there is. It's just a catch all. It's become just a catch all. And when you're yeah. actually around somebody that truly has T1 bipolar, you go, oh, there it is. Right. It's tough. It's tough. Yeah, it's, it's very so hard tough. on everybody. Um, you said there's um, other, other things going on. What else happened? Well, um, there was. Uh, in the fights and back and forth and this correlates back to me of she felt like I wasn't there for her or I wasn't um, uh, being what she needed in these situations so it caused her to uh, venture out of our marriage on two separate occasions mm -hmm. um, and it was early on in our marriage um, she in retrospect told me she was very unhappy and all these different things and so two different affairs essentially can like back to back over the course of like a four and a half or five month period. Um, and that was in the beginning of last year, um, the end of 2019, beginning of 2020. Yeah. She said it was never anything physical. And I actually do believe her. We've had a lot of counseling and therapy back and forth yeah. over it. Um, but it was when anytime the person that you love goes somewhere else for satisfaction, even if it's just emotional satisfaction, it's, it's a hard pill to swallow. Yeah. In, in, um, in, top in, it all, that is oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Top it all off. I got to hear this one. Uh, um, so it just was in. It was in, after talking. I've been in therapy pretty much the whole time since. It seems like it was as a result, not necessarily as a result, but these things were definitely weighing on her about her feeling terrible about herself. Um, she attempted uh, suicide mm -hmm. uh, last year uh, in June of last year. Man, I'm sorry. Uh, so we just had the one year anniversary of it, and um, uh, it's been it's been a really really hard two years. Yeah. yeah. And really, the reason why I'm calling is not to. I feel like I'm uh, venting or complaining, and I'm not. It's I'm more calling for encouragement because uh, so often we hear a verse, and I have it written on my fire helmet underneath the brim of my fire helmet. Is that man knows no greater love than this, that one would lay down his life for another. And my whole life, especially being a firefighter for the past 17 years, I have always thought about that as literally laying down your life for someone, dying for someone else. But God's almost put on my heart that 
you can lay down your life on a daily basis for someone. And like I said earlier, I, I choose her for better or for worse. Would I leave her if her, if her diagnosis or her illness was cancer or some other debilitating disease? I would never. So why would I consider that in a mental illness situation? So uh, I'm more calling for encouragement or, you know, when the days get hard. Yeah. So number one, hard a lot. yeah, yeah, it's real hard, man. And so first, thanks for sharing that. And for those people who live with somebody or love somebody who's got bipolar, um, there's not going to be a dry eye on this call because they've lived what you're going through. And so here's a couple of things to step back. And um, you may know this, but hopefully I can say it really clear for you. Um, when you've got somebody who's suffered physical abuse, sexual abuse, especially at the hands of loved ones, the reason that is so evil is it makes the only thing that can keep somebody well, which is relationships, it becomes the weapon. So her brain has been scanning her environment for the last 20 years, 30 years, looking for somebody trying to get close to her so that she can sound the alarm so that person can never get hurt, never hurt her again. And now that person is you, right? And so there's part of her brain that knows you are the safest, most loving, most wonderful person on planet Earth. And there's a part of her brain deep inside that says, get away from this guy. This is going to happen again. And it's going to happen again. And it's going to happen again. Right? That's what trauma does. And when folks stepping out on, mar on relationships and marriages, that's a common thing with bipolar one. Right? You, you probably were told that in therapy. Um, sexual acting out, addiction, just running and running and running and running until somebody collapses and then not running, right? Just like the whole world is paused. Um, it is hard. Does she have medical care? Is she taking her medication? Uh, yeah, she's been great about it. She has fought hard over the course of the past year. I think the suicide, okay. I mean, she did a, she, she scared everyone, including herself with her suicide attempt. She, she meant it when she tried it. It wasn't like one of those things to cry for attention sure. in any way. She, so it scared her and she has worked tirelessly over the course. We both have, we, I have not only fallen in love with your program, you've helped me more than you can, that I could ever put into words just with the tools that you keep putting in my toolbox. But well, I appreciate that, man. She's, and we, she's been seeing a, a, her a clinical psychologist as well as a psych, or I'm sorry, a clinical psychiatrist, pardon me, as well as our psychologist that we both see independently and together. Good. So here's, here's the things that you're going to need to do. Okay. Okay. And it's going to sound counterintuitive, but you are going to have to really work hard on making sure you're okay. Think of yourself as a stake in the ground into bedrock okay and you are married to somebody who on some parts of that month and you'll know what i'm talking about loves you with an intensity that people only dream about when it's good it's real good isn't it it's the best you're the most incredible person who's ever lived right maybe this is a terrible yeah. analogy and so i hope the internets don't beat me up for this it's kind of like a tether ball and you are that you are the pole and you married a, a, a bird who is constantly flying all over the place, but she's tethered to you. And sometimes, man, it is the greatest. And sometimes it feels like you're, the whole thing's going to fall over, right? Yeah. And I said tetherball and bird. I realize that doesn't all work out together. But um, you've got to be that rock in that center. Which, what does that mean? It means you've got to be diligent about taking care of your physical body. you got to exercise. And I know you're a fireman. I know you all do that. You got to be really diligent about having guy friends in your life, other men who will hold you accountable, who will laugh with you, who will you can go get a drink with, you can just go be with, right? You have to be really, really diligent about continuing to um, take care of your mental and spiritual self, right? Have people in your life, whether that's a counselor, whether that's a good pastor, whatever that looks like for you. And then you're going to have to just soak up the great, great times, and then you're going to have to default to routine and practice when things get hard. And I love your spirit. You're in it. Sounds like you are in it all in it. And then you're going to have to be able to hold your wife accountable. She's got to take her medication. I've seen some really remarkable success stories with folks who will continue to take their meds. And it's hard when things get really good for a season 
man, it's easy to stop taking your meds. And that's when you've got to double down and make sure you're still taking them. Um, and people who with bipolar, they really, really miss the high parts because it feels so good. Right. And right. y'all are going to have to be in that part together. But yeah, you've anchored yourself to a hurricane, which is great and hard and messy. And it's going to come down to you taking care of you. That's hard. It's real hard. We have five kids, too. And I, don't, I don't really get much of a break. I tell you that. You have five kids? We do. Together? Uh, no, she has two biological from her previous marriage. I have two biological from my previous marriage, and we have an adopted one between us. Y'all adopted a kid, too? Yes, sir. When did y'all do that? What has the last two years been like for y'all? <laughs> a little bit of a wild ride. What are you doing? <laughs> ah, man. John, you're my hero today. Yeah, you don't get much of a break. You know what that means? It means you absolutely have to have a break. Okay? And yeah. you're going to have to do something that firefighters do not like to do. You're going to have to ask for help. Yeah. And you're going to have to demonstrate for your kids, all five of them, that the best way you can love other people is to love yourself first. To make sure you're healthy first. Right? Yes, sir. And you know this from being a fireman. You're of no good to a, people in a burning building. You're no good in an EMS situation if you haven't slept. And if you're not feeling good. Yes, sir. And if you're not thinking clear. Right? M how much more important than it is for your kids. Right? That means you're going to have to have yes, somebody sir. come over and take care of those kids while you go work out. And you're going to have to have somebody come over if you need to sleep, if you and your wife need to go on a date. It's going to have to be part of your life. A regular, regular part. But I'll tell you this. Those guys, those kids won the lottery with you as dad. Your wife won the lottery. But you're going to have to have places where you can go lay down and be vulnerable to. At some point, if you are so strong all the time, that's, that, that pole is going to snap, right? Yeah, I feel it coming, to be honest with you. Okay. Then what do you got to do? I just, I just the hard part. I mean, I get the concept. It's just where do I find that time? Is I just it scares me. What do you got to do? <sighs> just take care of myself. So where are you going to find the time? You just have to. You just have to be intentional about it and, and do it. That's exactly right. How old are your kids? <laughs> uh, seven, eight, nine, ten, thirteen. Awesome. They are old enough now that you can bring them in. Here's what I want y'all to do as a family. This is going to be fun. You probably heard me tell other people this, but this is going to be good for your soul and for theirs. I want y'all to go to Michael's, like some crafty store, and I want you to get a Hobby Lobby, one of those kind of stores, and I want you to get a, a giant canvas. Is your wife an artist? She actually does like it a lot, yes. Yeah. A lot of folks at Bipolar find a lot of peace in art. I want y'all to also get some stick on letters and I want y'all to create the family values of your new family. Here's who we are. Here's how we treat each other. We do, we do hard work. We do hard things. We do chores. We treat each other with respect and I want y'all to paint it. I want y'all to have a family event as y'all come up together, all seven of you, God almighty, seven people, bro, all seven of you. And I want y'all to create this together and I want you to hang it somewhere in the living room and I want your wife to play a key role in the artistry of this and the peacemaking of, I want, I want all of y'all to be a part of this. Here's who we are. And then I want you to begin to roll off tasks and chores to these kids. Let them know that they play a cornerstone role in this house. Whether that's dishes, whether that's making breakfast for one another and for the family, whether that's helping with dinner prep, whether that's help, helping with yard prep, whether that's helping you and your side job, because all firemen I know have side jobs, all of, they're going to play a key role. And what that's going to allow you to do is, A, teach them responsibility, autonomy, strength, resilience. They're going to learn words at that meeting on how to help mom when mom's not doing well. How to... to 
lean on you and not on mom during those hard seasons and how to lean on mom and not on you when you're having hard seasons. And as a fireman, you will. And then you're going to begin to create space and you're going to lead the way for that family saying, I need one hour a day to go work out. I need one hour a day to journal, to do prayer time, to do meditation time. Because this is when I take care of me. And that means y'all are going to take care of each other. You're going to model that for them. And they're going to hold you accountable. Like my two little kids hold me accountable. Dad, you probably should go exercise. You're kind of being grumpy today. And you're going to build it and build it and build it. And then you're going to have a group of guys that you reach out to. And you can tell your kids, daddy's going to go be with his friends tonight. They're all old enough to stay at home by themselves now. And you're going to step out. You're going to model that. You're going to model friendships. You're going to model taking care of yourself. You're going to model taking care of your wife when it gets hard, loving like crazy when it's good. And you know this better than I do. There, this is not an easy road. It can be a deep and rich and fertile road, but it won't be an easy one. And dude, you say that um, I'm some kind of hero. I'm not, brother. You're the hero here. You're doing the hard work. I just talk on the podcast. You're doing the hard work day in and day out. And for all first responders out there, I used to show up on scenes. It's way easier to show up on a scene and help somebody else than it is to do the day-to-day grind in your own home. It's way easier. Every first responder I know, it's easier to show up at a car wreck. It's easier to show up in a burning building. It's easier to show up in a tragic situation than to be patient and kind on a daily basis. That's hard. We can do this. Y'all can do this. Thank you so much for your call, Brother John. We're thinking about you. Let us know how I can help as we, as you make this journey with your wife and your five kids. Whew, you're in it.